Now let's move into what we'll call thematic structure or thematic design. The terms refer to how The Last of Us presents its world and recurring themes. The interactive design of training, escalation, and remixing provides a template of self-reference that the game uses to build off itself. Let's look at how the game uses that pattern to draw connections between unrelated scenarios. We're accustomed to discussing video games in terms of storytelling and interactive design alone, so we need to distinguish between narrative and associative relationships in The Last of Us. The Last of Us will introduce a given event, setting, or scenario during the course of the game. It will then revisit an altered version of that situation, often with ironic changes. This form of self-reference gives the game cohesion through implied connections rather than through direct narrative flow. Story connections will share a common explanation found within the story itself. For an example of this, consider the multiple environments of urban decay. These appear at different times and in different places. They resemble each other because they share a common cause. Everything's gone to hell in the wake of the Cordyceps pandemic. We can refer to story elements to explain the similarities between these scenes. By contrast, we're focusing on correlations that do not share a narrative cause. Let's look at some examples of these side by side for comparison. In two instances, Ellie echoes Joel's words from earlier in the game. Shit, you're gonna go in there? I wanna see what we can find. You're gonna find my body when I die from a heart attack. Don't worry. I got this. If I get into trouble down there, you make every shot count. Yeah. I got this. And then later this. You guys are pretty good at this stuff. It's called luck. And it is gonna run out. I'd say we make a pretty good team. We got lucky. We can explain this resemblance by referring to story elements. Ellie respects Joel. When she repeats his words, we understand that Ellie has internalized Joel's confidence and poise. By contrast, we see an associative repetition here. If I get into trouble down there, you make every shot count. Yeah. I've done this before. We have no story-based reason why David would repeat Joel's words. He doesn't know Joel outside of his reputation, and he wasn't around for the initial interaction. The Last of Us puts Joel's words in David's mouth to signify to the player that David is establishing, in a short period of time, the same kind of trust relationship that Ellie built with Joel over the course of several chapters. Later on we'll take a look at how The Last of Us establishes David as a kind of anti-Joel, but this is our first example of an associative repetition. The distinction between story and associative relationships is important, so let's contrast examples once more to hit the point home. As we saw during our examination of L3 prompts, Ellie and Joel see a plume of heavy smoke by the church when they approach Billstown. When they get to the church, they see a pile of burned clickers. The game trusts that the player will identify this pyre as the source of the smoke that we saw earlier. I've seen worse. These details refer to each other, and in this way imply the story. We find a compliment to Bill's pyre in Pittsburgh. However, the hunters have disposed the bodies of tourists that they've hunted instead of clickers. These two pyres have no direct relationship through the story. We cannot explain the presence of the second pyre by referring to the first. By repeating this site in two different environments, the game creates a sense of continuity. We draw a mental connection between these two scenes, and this grants the experience a kind of cohesion that would have otherwise been absent. Even more, the two pyres imply information about the story that is not explicitly told to the player. Bill's pyre consists of clickers that have advanced far into their infections. Bill uses his pyre as part of a general strategy of crowd control. Well, Bill used them as a form of defense. Maybe they're doing the same. He disposes of advanced infected, ostensibly to prevent their development into bloaters, yet he keeps the regular infected around as protection against hunters. The hunter's pyre, however, consists of uninfected humans. The hunters likewise use their pyre as part of a crowd control strategy. Yet, whereas Bill uses his pyre to prevent the infected from getting out of control, the hunters use their pyre to dispose of the bodies of those whom they've already overwhelmed by force. <laughs> No. 
Also like Bill, the hunter's pyre is part of their scavenging work. The hunters scavenge off the bodies of innocent travelers, while Bill draws his stock from the town's environment. So this is how association and self-reference work together. The Last of Us takes key elements of the first scenario, and then flips them around in the second. We get a sense of how much more inhumane the hunters have become through their collective identity. The pyre appears right at the start of Pittsburgh, and, by analogy with Bill's pyre, we understand that the hunters treat human life with the same disregard that other groups so far have shown only to infected carriers. So we've just seen how this structure of parallel imagery serves two main functions. First, it creates a sense of continuity between events that don't have a story connection. Second, it can help us understand the fictional world as we correlate each image to the other. The Last of Us is filled with examples of this kind of parallel imagery in different contexts. Before we take a look at the most prominent examples of this, we should consider the foundation of parallel imagery found throughout the game. Compare the dead soldiers in the slant office tower in Boston with the dead soldiers in the streets of Pittsburgh. In Boston, the presence of dead soldiers owes to infected violence. In Pittsburgh, the presence of dead soldiers owes to human violence. Through a similar but altered image, we see parallels drawn between the hunters and the infected. Both are violent forces that overwhelm the rule of law. As well, the hunters care as much about disposing of human remains as the infected do, suggesting that they're equally uncivilized. We also see quarantine zone military forces likened to the infected through parallel imagery. In the sewers outside Pittsburgh, we encounter the corpse of a man named Kyle alongside the bodies of several children. They had barricaded themselves in this room against the infected, and Kyle killed each child out of mercy, finally killing himself. During Joel's and Ellie's approach to Salt Lake City, we encounter an RV with a similar scene. Again, we see a pile of dead children covered in sheets. We see that these kids were killed to protect them from suffering and trauma. At the entrance to the RV, we see the body of an adult apparently thrown down by force and killed. It's reasonable to assume that these parents killed their children in anticipation of quarantine zone military violence. Joel says earlier that the military executed people waiting for entrance to the quarantine zone, sacrificing the few to save the many. Your fellow hunters do this? Cute. And no, my money's on the military. Why would they mow down all these people? You can't let everyone in. <laughs> so they killed them? And dead people don't get infected. You sacrifice the few to save the many. It's kind of shitty. Yeah. We also know firsthand of the military's brutal triage tactics since we witnessed their cold-blooded killing of Sarah. The structuring technique is the same as before. The same scene repeats, and, by altering elements in the implied stories, The Last of Us likens the morality of survivors to the indiscriminate violence of the infected. We also see this with increasingly exotic animal encounters. Twice we encounter untouchable animals. Yeah, you're gonna want to stay away from those. It's not like it is in the zone. These are wild. We later see a pack of monkeys at the university. That was kind of awesome. Well, first time seeing a monkey? First time seeing a monkey. We've got an escalation here both in exoticism and the danger posed by the respective animals. Stay easy. As well, in two locations, we encounter touchable animals. Joel encounters a horse he can pet at the hydroelectric plant. And later, he encounters a dog. Hey, buddy. That's Buckley. Not much of a guard dog. That's a good boy. Maybe good to have around. Later, in Salt Lake City, Ellie and Joel encounter giraffes, and Joel shows Ellie how to pet them. Come here, come here. Hurry up. Again, we see the parallel imagery of one experience modified into something similar but new. <laughs> so fucking cool. My favorite example of this pattern appears when we correlate the events of Joel's truck ride with Tommy and Sarah in the beginning with Joel's and Ellie's entrance into Pittsburgh. Let's review the core elements of the first scene. Tommy stops when traffic clogs the road and they can go no further. Everyone and their mother had the same damn idea. 
infected assault the car ahead of them, dragging people out of the vehicles. Tommy takes an alternate route. Tommy gently bumps into this old man running away from the infected carnage. Finally, the ride ends when another truck slams into them from the side. We see all of these elements present in Joel's and Ellie's entrance into Pittsburgh. Joel stops when traffic clogs the road. Oh, perfect. The abandoned vehicles are now part of the hunter's trap rather than part of a mass escape from Austin. Joel backs up and takes an alternate route. Screw it. And Joel plows through a hunter. A bus hits the side of Joel and Ellie's truck. Finally, Joel and Ellie are violently pulled from their vehicle, echoing the invasive attacks of the infected during the opening. Through self-reference and parallel imagery, The Last of Us contrasts the opening's uncontrolled outbreak with the controlled guile of the hunter's trap. The conversation between hunters that we considered before fits this pattern as well. Oh yeah, you were a part of that? I heard about this. Yeah, there's one chick, she would just not give up. I've never seen anyone with so much fucking energy. It took a couple minutes to snuff everyone else, and fucking five hours to hunt her ass down. Jesus. Sometimes you gotta earn your keep, right? Yeah, I guess. We are about to give up when she started shooting at us. It's stupid. She could have got away. I had two other guys keep her busy. I took out my rifle, lined up her little head in the crosshairs, and pow! And that was that. Damn. Well, maybe you should have kept her. You know, made her one of us. No, no way. That girl, she'd have killed us all in her sleep. This is not foreshadowing in the literal sense that one event predicts the other. It is associative foreshadowing that prepares the player for what will occur later in a different context. The game uses this technique powerfully when it portrays David as a kind of anti-Joel through association. First, we have shared problem-solving sequences that build off the initial trust exercises we learned from Tess. Halfway through the lumber mill, the game taps into that interactive vocabulary as David gives Ellie a boost. As well, David and Ellie cooperate to move a heavy storage cabinet in front of a window, much as Joel and Tess moved a bookshelf during the game's first cooperative action. Next, David saves Ellie from a clicker during a scripted scene during which the player has to mash the square button to break free. We've seen similar scenes throughout the game. In each instance, Joel is saved by someone whom he either trusts or whom he comes to trust. We see this with Tommy. We see this with Tess. We see this with Bill. We also see it with Ellie. By association, this prompts the player to trust David as another reliable character. It refers to other close bonded relationships, and it implicitly refers to the ultimate close bond between Ellie and Joel. Third, the game prompts associations with Joel when Ellie receives the rifle from David. The hunting rifle is a token of Joel's trust in Ellie. When Ellie receives the rifle from David at the start of this encounter, we are prompted to recall generally the acts that establish trust between Joel and Ellie. Fourth, as we examined before, the game puts Joel's words in David's mouth. Joel tells Ellie during that trust-making moment to make every shot count, and David repeats those words at the start of his fight alongside Ellie. I've done this before. Though the game uses parallels to get us to associate David with Joel, it also uses ironic inversion to show how the characters are opposites. David is a leader, whereas Joel is a loner. David will actively build social bonds, whereas Joel is nearly unapproachable. Joel attributes his survival to luck and circumstance, whereas David credits divine providence. Both Joel and David are capable of extreme violence. However, David enacts depravities that upset even someone as hardened and distant as Joel. Oh, Christ. I gotta find her. I gotta find her. It's worth noting here that during this scene, the player cannot get Joel to run. 
by restricting the player's ability to brush past the cleaning room where David's community prepares its cannibalistic meals, The Last of Us forces the player to enact Joel's shock and horror at what David is capable of. The references that build David up as a kind of anti-Joel emerge more dangerously during his fight against Ellie. Fair warning, we're about to look at a couple of gruesome Ellie deaths. David visibly kills with a machete using the exact same techniques that the player has performed with Joel. Both characters kill with a neck chop and by running through their enemies. As well, David is the only other character in the game besides Joel and Ellie who stalks and uses all his senses to take in the environment. We noted this detail in passing during our first look at interactive structure. We see David sneak and pop his head up over countertops. This is a representation of the same action that Joel and the player have performed through the entire game. The movements of David's head are analogous to the player's own back and forth panning with the game's camera while stalking as Joel. I think that these references and reversals have an important purpose. They make this chapter about much more than Ellie's struggle against David. The chapter also explores the potential dark side of her relationship with Joel. We've been performing Joel's character through the majority of the game, so at the start of this episode we're too close to his character to see him as Ellie does. So the game gives us control of Ellie and presents us with David, a character who fills Joel's function as a combat companion and would-be father figure. When David later serves as an enemy with Joel's same skill set, we can better appreciate the ambiguity of Joel's character from Ellie's point of view. And recall, Ellie's lot was just thrown in with Joel's, as it was with David's. The sequence can be taken as an expression of Ellie's anxieties about Joel as a protector. The skills that Joel uses to protect are the very same skills that David uses to hunt. Given this, I think it's important that Joel appears immediately after Ellie slays David. The doppelganger is dead, and Ellie ended the nightmare herself. Up to this point, we've looked at less evident examples of this particular form of self-reference. I've given these smaller examples priority in order to establish how thoroughly The Last of Us uses this structuring technique. These larger, more obvious examples emerge from a background of smaller instances of self-reference and recall. So let's take a look at those high points that have been built on this structural foundation. First up, we have the photograph of Joel and Sarah. Joel first refuses the photograph when it's offered to him by Tommy. Tommy is a member of Joel's biological family, and he scavenged the photo from the outskirts of Austin. I'm good. You sure? I mean... I've said I'm good. Joel later takes the photograph when it's offered to him by Ellie. Here. Maria showed this to me, and I, uh... I stole it. I hope you don't mind. Here, we have another set of reversals presented with parallel imagery. At this point in the game, Ellie is Joel's adopted family, and this contrasts with the natural family that Tommy represents. As well, Tommy acquired the photo legitimately, whereas Ellie stole the photo from Elizabeth. Joel rejects the loss of his biological daughter when facing his past, and he accepts that same loss when facing his future. To put it another way, Joel cannot overcome his past through his past. Acceptance only occurs when its vehicle is his future life. Here, The Last of Us also varies the parallel images through its mechanical presentation. With Tommy, Joel holds the photograph, and the player can only return it by pressing triangle. I'm good. The Last of Us remixes the act by giving the player different interfaces, one literally at arm's length, and the other through the player's inventory. In the second instance, Joel takes the photograph and the picture joins the rest of his documents. Through these means, The Last of Us communicates the intimacy of the second offer. Insofar as characters are bound to their inventories, the photo has become part of Joel. And now we come to the big one. The game's beginning and end are parallel images. The game is bookended by the most obvious and one of the most significant uses of this technique. The concluding sequence is a self-referential reversal of the game's opening chapter, starting from Joel's entrance to the Firefly headquarters in Salt Lake City, and continuing on to his arrival at Elizabeth and Tommy's village. As always, let's look at the initial image first. We start in control of Sarah during a time of chaos. We then take a vehicle to escape the infected. They said, uh, armies put up roadblocks on the highway. 
No getting into Travis County. We need to get the hell out. Take 71. 71. That's where I'm headed. Sarah gets injured in the escape. What is it? My leg hurts. How bad? Pretty bad. We're gonna need to run. And Joel carries her to safety. Keep us safe. Come on, baby. Now hold on tight. Okay. They encounter the military on the perimeter of a makeshift quarantine zone. We need help. Stop. Please. It's my daughter. I think her leg is broken. Stop right there. Joel is under the soldier's gun. His life is saved, and his daughter dies. Oh no. After the title sequence, 20 years later, we're delivered into a heavy military environment, the Boston Quarantine Zone. Compliance with all city personnel is mandatory. Look at that. Ration line hasn't opened yet. So that's the broad view of the opening. Now let's look at the general trends of the game's conclusion, noting the variations and self-reference along the way. First, Joel starts in the remains of a heavy military environment. We find a couple of ironies here. First off, this environment belongs to the faction directly opposed to the remnants of the U.S. Army. We saw those troops back in Boston. Second, Boston's military environment was alive, on its last legs, but it was still alive. You don't get much deader than Salt Lake City. Joel is twice under the military's gun. The elements of the first instance mirror almost exactly. She's not breathing. He's attacked while trying to save the life of his daughter. We see a reversal of outcome in the second instance. Where was he operating? Joel had previously been powerless, and he relied completely upon Tommy for protection. Where? Now he's empowered, and he saves himself. Joel kills those who threaten his foster daughter. Shut the hell up! And he saves her life. Come on, baby girl. I got you. I got you. Ellie is unconscious, and Joel carries her out of the facility as he had carried Sarah before. Joel then encounters Marlene, the primary threat to his foster daughter, and he has her under the gun. This is a reversal of the situation before, when he was at the mercy of his aggressors. Tommy saved Joel's life. But Marlene has no backup, and Joel executes her. You just come after her. Next, Joel and Ellie take a vehicle ride. However, instead of escaping the pandemic chaos in the beginning, Joel and Ellie escape the human outpost that intends to end the pandemic. Finally, we leave the game in control of Ellie, Joel's foster daughter. The pattern of preparation, self-reference, and revision comes to its fullest expression here. Actually, kind of pretty, ain't it? Yeah. We start the game in control of a child who belongs to one future. Sarah starts from a place of security. My baby girl. Sarah starts at home with her dad. I don't think I ever told you, but uh, Sarah and I used to take hikes like this. We leave the game in control of a child whose future starts with no reliable home. She has a home with Joel, but this home depends to some degree upon their agreement not to break Joel's secret. This is an ambiguous conclusion. I swear. And this powerful ambiguity is only made possible through the structure of parallel imagery found on every level of thematic design in The Last of Us.